Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 10 of the No Frills Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Camps, and joining me tonight, I have a very special guest, Courtney Black. Courtney, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. Courtney, uh, so I'm just going to come right out and, and just say this. I'm, I'm very excited to have you join me tonight. You are actually my first guest of 2024. So uh, I think what an awesome way to start the new year with somebody as fascinating as you are. So thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. I love my Lee County teacher peeps. Um, miss everybody like crazy. And I'm very honored just to be on your podcast tonight. Thank you. So, uh, Courtney, for those out there that are listening, Courtney is an education project manager with the International Space Station National Laboratory. And kind of want to get into that and your years, you know, that you had of teaching service in Lee County. Uh, and I just, you know, I mentioned prior to this podcast when we had spoke, I, I really find you fascinating. I, like you have the coolest experiences uh, that I've seen uh, as an educator and supporting the science and STEM programs in schools. And I was hoping maybe you could give the listeners a little bit of a background on, you know, yourself, your current position and, a, a little bit of some things that led you to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started teaching back in 2006. And to just clear the record, I never wanted to be a teacher. No one should have to work that hard for so little money. And <laughs> yeah. I, I very much fell into teaching um, when my sisters went to a private school in Lee County, and I would drop them off and um, was kind of trying to figure out what my next steps. I just finished law school in England, um, was trying to figure out if I wanted to get my master's in comparative law or do something different. And they said, hey, you're here every day. Why don't you look at substitute teaching? And it was in a middle school math class that I started trying to teach a lesson that I'm like, guys, I don't understand this really well but this is how I can kind of explain it to you. And we might have to do this together and figure it out together, but I think we can get there. And this girl was sitting there and she said, oh my gosh, I understand. And she's like, you explained it in a way different than our normal teacher. And, and now I understand. And any teacher will tell you that that's the drug. That's that uh, aha moment that uh, you're like, <laughs> okay, I'm hooked. You, like, struck, you struck gold. <laughs> yes. And it very much felt like God was telling me, you're a teacher. And I'm like, no, I'm not. It's like, yes, you are. <laughs> um, and I then spent 14 years in the classroom and really kind of found my groove in middle school science. I started teaching eighth grade science and then moved to elementary science, but always had a real keen fascination for space and space science. And found that my students really were enthralled as well. So I started trying to gather resources and get get involved in organizations that were space science related. I applied to be a teacher liaison with the Space Foundation and applied for seat crew at Space Center Houston and was a space station ambassador and a jet propulsion laboratory solar system ambassador. I applied for all these programs and really started incorporated space into every lesson. Um, if it was a biology lesson, I'm like, hey, look, they're growing plants on the International Space Station. We can grow tomatoes that uh, from tomato seeds that flew on the International Space Station. And I started incorporating it in. And a few summers ago, it was 2020, and I found that I had a little extra energy in the summer because we'd been teaching, we'd been doing distance learning, teaching virtually. And there was a, a remote position for an, a project manager to help develop a new program with the International Space Station National Lab. And I applied for it and got the position. And then at the end of my time there, they said, hey, would you be interested in joining us full time? And I said, well, I really I love being in the classroom. And I thought about it. I went back in the classroom for a few months and had just realized that I felt like that my time in the classroom was drawing to an end. And that with this new position, I could support educators. And that was kind of the caveat. As long as I could support educators, I could leave the classroom. And that's, you know, and that's really fascinating uh, in the sense that, like you had said, 
you're still able to support educators in turn support students, you know, long term with the, uh, you know, your current position. But I just have to stop and just ask you, England? Okay. Well, like, well, where, where we go? Like, I, I, I had heard about this, I think, once one time when we went out with a group of friends, uh, you know, for dinner. Uh, and I recall, so where did that all come from? And I, I, I'm sorry to get off track, but I just have to ask you. No, I think that I entered and I would really strongly encourage my students and any students that I still interact with through outreaches. You know, don't be in such a hurry to, oh gosh, teachers and parents are going to kill me. Don't be in such a hurry <laughs> to go to college. Don't, don't make that the end game or the end point. Because if you don't know what you really want to do, and you go get this degree, you're going to find yourself back in college a couple of times until you figure it out or going to trade school or getting extra certifications. Because I had I got my first degree in general communications and worked in that field for two years and hated it. So I was like, well, that's terrible. What am I going to do next? And yeah. a friend of mine and I decided it was it was a little bit of a legally blonde moment. Let's move to England and go to law school and moved over there before we'd even gotten in. Oh, oh, wow. It was definitely that quarter life crisis kind of moment (laughs) and studied for three years. And I loved learning about the law. It was fascinating. And when I got done, they were like, you, my parents were like, you keep going back to school. You keep going and getting more trained. Like, maybe you just really like school and they kind of encouraged me to consider teaching. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Um, But as we know, it, it, it worked out. I I would laugh at because I'm listening and, you know, as a career changer myself, so my degree is in communications, media studies, Mm -hmm. and the same thing. I spent, you know, a year or two in a cubicle working in, you know, communications, uh, post-production, for television back when I lived in New York and I was like, no, this isn't for me. Like, why did I just spend four years and why did I do like internships and all that stuff? And it right. just wasn't for me. And it can't, I have some teachers in my family and I felt like I was a, you know, success. I was successful in school, good student, all those things. And what did I fall back on? Something I was familiar with and something I had success with in my life. And that was cool, you know, and, and that's, so I definitely can relate to that. Um, but just to have that experience, I think, is pretty remarkable to just take that chance and go out there and put yourself out there. Um, and, and speaking of putting yourself out there, what, like, what are, what's going on, um, right now? You had sent me this, uh, like this picture that was so cool. Um, originally I was trying to fit for the promo cover for this episode and kind of like the wind's blowing and got the NASA sign in the background and, I, you, you must see so many cool things at your current position. You know, I do. I, I'm very blessed and very privileged to have the job that I have because I get to go to rocket launches and I get to get on base at Cape Canaveral Air Force or Space Force Base, Patrick Space Force Base in Cape Canaveral are kind of connected where they launch rockets and where they have the Space Force Base. Um, I, I have a NASA badge and I, I almost feel like Someone's going to figure it out and take it away from me, but I get to go, <laughs> I get to go and do some really cool things um, and meet some fascinating people. The picture that I originally sent you was in front of vehicle assembly building. Okay. And that's where they put the big rockets on the stacks before they wheeled them out to the launch pad. So it's a building that's 525 feet tall. It's so large. It has it. it um, conducts its own water cycle inside, and sometimes it'll rain inside because oh, wow. of the condensation um, forming into precipitation and falling. So it's it's this huge building, and there with a couple of schools, I think it was St. Francis in Lee County, they were like, hey, can you Zoom with us? And I'm like, I can do better than that. I can Zoom with you outside the vehicle assembly building. So I did a mini uh, virtual field trip kind of showing them, and I think I took the, that picture on that day. Yeah, when you said that to me, I was like, uh, this is awesome. I got to try to find a way to make it work out. And you know, then so we went with the other, you know, professional headshot, but that like action shot, it's like something cool is happening in the background at that moment when that picture was taken. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let me be honest. Most days, my job is a job and it feels yeah. like a job, but there are some real special days where yeah. I get to work with 
educators, or I get to do a really cool uh, virtual field trip, or I, I get to talk to a principal investigator that's sending their science to the International Space Station. And those are pretty great days. Now, in a way, it doesn't feel like it, was, it came full circle for you, because I know back in 2018, um, was that when you did the, the contact uh, and you had that in-flight educational downlink? Well, the educational downlink event was with the entire district in 2020, but then you coordinated the amateur radio on the International Space Station contact in 2018, correct? Correct. It was the Ares contact is something that I'd always wanted to do, but you need some pretty hefty duty um, radio equipment. And the folks over at the Fort Myers Amateur Radio Club and CenturyLink contacted the Lee County School District. And they're like, hey, we've got some ham radio operators that really want to do an Ares contact, but they need an educator. Do you have anybody in mind? And I, I don't know if it was Lee Hughes or um, who had recommended me, but they were like, yeah, we've got a science nerd teacher that won't shut <laughs> up about it. Um, <laughs> keeps <laughs> pestering us. Um, so they put us in contact and like literally the stars aligned because this was something I didn't have the equipment, but I'd always wanted to do it. I had a plan already written and they had the equipment and they were willing to partner with us. So that was about a year and we got to talk to, uh, Dr. Annan Chancellor, Serena Annan Chancellor, um, for a 10 minute radio contact. Two years later, I applied for an in-flight downlink. Now that's a video chat as opposed to just ham radio. Yeah. Um, and that took place actually February 26, 2020. And as we all know, two mm -hmm. weeks later, the world shut down. Mm -hmm. So it was one of their last um, in-flight education downlinks before COVID. I remember 2020 because uh, at that time I was over at Sanibel. Uh, although we were doing, uh, I was teaching a fifth grade ELA and social studies, my classes with the science class, as I recall, it was you were facilitating, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and it was like a district wide kind of initiative. Right. We right? were trying to get all, all the schools involved, 50 years, 50 schools, because they were cele celebrating 50 years um, since the Apollo missions. So we wanted to try to get as many schools invested, and then we opened the applications up to all the schools in the district because, it, you know, it's really too big of an event to just say, well, these are my students and I'm just going to do it with my students. So we hosted at Fort Myers High School. Um, we had 20 students that were selected, I think, from 12 different schools. So it was really cool, um, but oh, again, a lot of work. And it was kind of that passion project. Um, yeah. extra on the end of the day of, you know, my already full-time job with my full plate. <laughs> so, but it was amazing. It was very, very cool. Uh, well, you had a, that stretch 2018 and in 2019, you won the Foundation for Lee County Public Schools and Golden Apple. And yes. then you had the, uh, you know, the downlink in 2020. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with being a Golden Apple recipient, do, do you feel, and those who are not familiar with how it works, uh, you know, in the school district of Lee County down here in, in Southwest Florida, we have this wonderful organization. It's the Foundation for Lee County Public Schools, Inc., and they have the Golden Apple program uh, where they you know, highlight six representatives of the outstanding teachers in Lee County. Um, you go through an interview process, blind application, and then these observations from the selection committee. Were you tying in any of your, you know, science passion, your content, uh, any of these cool things you were doing at the time with the space station or with NASA, um, kind of like during your observations? You know, I, I feel like I bring a little bit of space into almost every lesson, uh, but I was really, it was a, a strange year, but the big shout out to Foundation for Lee County Public Schools I went to Lee County schools when I was a kid. I had teachers that were in the golden apple process. Um, and I, I saw how dynamic they were and that recognition. It's the, my golden apple still sits on my desk in my office at my new, new job. Um, it's still one of the proudest moments of my life. Um, I, I can't 
express the gratitude that I still feel towards the foundation. And I keep looking for ways like, how can I help them out? Maybe I can put them in touch and we can, you know, support more educators. Uh, I really wish that more foundations and more districts, I didn't realize this wasn't a common recognition program. Different districts do it a lot differently. And um, like here in Brevard County, it is not student and parent nominated. You have to be nominated by your administrator. And I was like, well, why? Like uh, it meant the world to me that my students took the time to, to fill out a nomination form. Not that I didn't love my administrators and would have loved the recognition from them, but I, I just realized how special it was. That, so, that, yeah, I didn't know that. I, I, yeah, I guess I assumed, I don't usually, you know, if it's teacher of the year, you know, district teacher of the year, school, you know, teacher of the year, but I, I didn't know that, that, uh, you know, many counties aren't as similar as kind of what Lee County does with the foundation. No, Lee County is, is very special. And the fact that it's such a large county and they find a way to make it, um, identify educators that are representative of the excellent teaching that goes on in Lee County is just awe-inspiring. And I, you know, I hope that other districts would adopt that model. I really think that that, it, it meant more than, than just about anything. So, um, but yeah, I would always incorporate space. I, I love science too. I love the principles of science. I love seeing kids being scientists. Um, we had talked a little bit about, uh, about curriculum and, and thought, and I said, Oh, I have big thoughts on curriculum. <laughs> um, because what a lot of people don't realize is that curriculum and curriculum writing, it's a, it's a big money industry. So there are lots of people banking on buying books. And I can remember a conversation that I had with one of my principals who said, I don't understand why you want to grow these tomato seeds that flew in space. Where does that fit in the curriculum? And I kind of stopped and I thought, I said, I can teach parts of the plant with these tomato seeds. I can teach independent versus dependent variable. I can teach tropisms. I can teach probably eight different standards with this one activity. And with all the respect in the world, this is the curriculum, not the textbook. A student should never, ever, ever learn science purely from a textbook. Does it mean we don't need to raise science literate students? However, that should never be the goal. Science has to be hands on. So I get, you know, really passionate about it. <laughs> and I would try to come up with the activity that were activities that were going to teach the standards, you know, and some people would say that that's teaching to the test. I'm like, no, good teaching is good teaching. And I can have, I can train students to be successful on a unit of measurement, like a standardized test by doing fun, engaging, hands on and inspiring activities in the classroom. They're not mutually exclusive. And, and that is what's missing, honestly. Um, I, I've seen throughout my career, well, ni the year 19 for me, uh, where, you know, a student is handed a, a textbook or a log book and read this. And, you know, it's just so abstract sometimes. And then you do go into those classrooms where you, you have the labs taking place, those hands on experiments and the kids are excited. They want to. I, I've seen kids bored out of their mind, honestly, with science content. And I've seen students that it looks like there's a party in the classroom because they're just so enthused, you know, and just excited about what's happening. And it's that hands on approach. And I, I feel that there's still a gap between that, you know, the two different schools of thought with that hands on kind of learning and with just the, you know, here's a textbook here. Yeah. This is a thrill and kill, and, and, and I think that's something that definitely needs to improve over time. I, and I, this, that's not a criticism towards educators because, you know, I, I've kind of thought about try, how would I help educators, and some of them are just trying to survive. They're just trying to get through day to day because of the added pressures and responsibilities without the commiserate pay increase um, to teach their lessons ensure their kids, you know, are safe, um, ensure that their students are, you know, learning. And that can be very, very difficult. So 
Mm -hmm. It's not a criticism of educators, but we need to do, and I'm saying we, as those that have a vested interest in the education of our future workforce, that next generation, we need to do a better job supporting teachers. We need to provide them everything they could possibly need. Um, and sometimes it is, especially for newer, newer teachers, those activities that are all laid out for them. You know, if you want to use this, this would be or having, you know, different activities for that same standard that appeal to multiple multiple modalities, because it's not just reading and writing, although that's an important part of science. Um, it's also hearing and, and singing and chanting and, you know, the order of the planets is best done in a chant. Um, it depends on what you're teaching, but you can really engage those different parts of the brain. Um, and especially having kids move, you say it sounds like a party and I'm sure <laughs> that there were times my principal walked in to do an observation <laughs> and wanted to slowly back out of the classroom. Yeah. Like, it's like a beehive of activity there going on. And, but you know what, you know, it's like controlled chaos. Right. Right. <laughs> and just because it's loud and just because they're up and standing on chairs or moving doesn't mean there's not learning happening. In fact, um, you know, there are a lot of studies that show that kinesthetic learning is so important, getting kids to move. I know that whole brain teaching where you're doing an activity while you're saying the thing you're trying to remember um, helps engage a different part of the brain. So I think it's important for educators to remember that but also for those community members and organizations to support educators so that they can be that kind of teacher. Well, I got to give a shout out to the science department, curriculum department at uh, the school district of Lee County, because I did see firsthand that they uh, pack up these materials for the teachers, for the science teachers. I, I can't speak to all their districts, you know, obviously, but at least within Lee County, they ship them out to the science teachers and they have their materials. So they're not just getting, you know, the log books and, and the journals and all those things. And I think that does help, like you were saying, about the um, younger teachers or perhaps new career changers that are new to the profession and don't really have materials to start with or know where to begin. Uh, so I, I think that that's pretty cool that Lee County does that, at least uh, hopefully other districts do as well. Joe, I still email Jen McBride because I try to help teachers here in Brevard. And I'm like, hey, do you have that activity? Or do you have, can you share that with me? I'd like to share it with some teachers here. I mean, they, and I'm not sure, Jared, is Jared Wallace still there? Jim McBride and Jared Wallace and, and Jalen. Well, yeah, Jay, like, yeah, I think Jim McBride actually left just not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. But uh, Jalen, yeah. we actually had Jalen at our school um, about two weeks ago at Tanglewood. So, yeah. You know, Jalen's doing a great job now. They they do a phenomenal job, and Lee County is very very lucky to have them. Um, and with the curriculum and the and the STEM kits, so that you can do the activities, so you're not going to 12 different stores trying to buy sand and salts and iron filings, so that you can you know, figure out a mixture and how to separate a mixture. It it, it is amazing the kind of support that Lee County has and you don't realize that that's not everywhere. Now what would you say you're uh, say fifth grade science teacher and well at least you know in, in the state of Florida they, there's a fifth grade science state assessment that the students take at the end of the year but mm -hmm. there seems to be sometimes gaps from the younger grades and this is once again it's not a criticism it's not a critique on, right. you know, second, third, fourth grade, but there are standards that mm -hmm. usually typically fifth graders are expected to know, like on uh, certain you know, principles of science coming up to fifth grade. Right. But it's, in your opinion, I mean, do we start as early as kindergarten teaching science content? Like, you know, obviously, you know, thinking academic audience naturally, but if, if you, we're in charge of the curriculum department. Like, what would you start incorporating science into instruction? Um, and do you feel that that's something that needs improvement? Absolutely. Um, and here's the thing. I think it's because we teach sub subjects in isolation. And when we teach those subjects in isolation, we create more work for ourselves. Um, I'm saying we like I'm still in the classroom. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, what's a what, teacher? What, always a teacher. I also just gonna say, you know, what's the what's a teacher? What's an educator? Always an educator. You got an educator's heart, and uh, yeah, we are still we. 
I I can remember creating resources for my my third and fourth grade teachers as a fifth grade teacher saying, hey, this is what I need you to cover and uh, and get to so that when they come to me in fifth grade, they have that foundational knowledge for science. And I had one teacher said, you know, I love you black, but I just do not have time to teach science. We're so focused on ELA, especially in third grade. And my heart broke a little bit because what we need to do is look at those third grade ELA standards and have those science articles that they are not only working on reading comprehension, but also becoming scientifically literate. And if you can cover a few standards with an activity along with a reading passage and tie it together, you can actually strengthen their reading because you're providing that hands-on interactive that they feel a part of. A lot of times if kids aren't strong readers, they're going to look at a passage and remove themselves, you know, mentally, emotionally. They're not, they're not going to invest. But if they see their part in the whole ecosystem of that lesson, then you're going to drive it home. And I think we do need to start in kindergarten. Uh, Carrie Burns, who I think she teaches at Canterbury now, was my kid's kindergarten teacher, and she did a phenomenal job. I mean, it's like my worst nightmare to have 20 kindergartners and take them outside to do a science activity, but she would do it. I mean, that makes me break out in hives. Fourth and fifth grade was about as long, as young as I could go. (laughs) Yeah, that... uh... I got to give her credit for that because say they, and as a former kindergarten teacher, when I started, you know, early in my career, I could never imagine the science. And I'm, listen, I'm guilty. It, it was, we were so focused on teaching, you know, kids sight words and, you know, phonics and all right. those things that science, like, well, science in kindergarten, science in primary, like it was unheard of. So right. hopefully that kind of, there's a shift and we start to kind of move in that direction and, and get the kids because sometimes it is, it's like, well, now they're in fourth grade. Now we're, they're finally getting introduced to some sort of science, you know, curriculum or fifth grade. And sometimes I think that it's just a little too late. Right. And but. it, it kind of dilutes the importance of it. Cause if you don't teach it every year, they get to fifth grade and they're like, well, why am I just learning this now? Like my, my other teachers didn't, so it's obviously not that important where we know that a majority of the high paying careers that are coming up in the near future are STEM careers. So you need that foundational science in order to be um, successful. And kids need to see themselves as scientists. They need to see themselves as engineers, as mathematicians, um, as technologists. They can have a working and literate understanding of all of these concepts we t- we say things like math is hard well yeah it's hard but it's worth it and you can do it when we say things are hard like we say space is hard we're seeing a real deficit in the uh, workforce of the space industry because we're not seeing enough people choosing majors such as engineering and coding let alone you know women that are choosing these it's just still staggeringly low, 18 and 20 percent, respectively, for engineering and computer science are the uh, percentages of women that choose these majors. So we really have to work at helping these kids see themselves. And it starts in elementary. And and that's that's remarkable. And I'll be honest, I was unaware that those numbers are like that and that there is you're not getting as many, uh, you know, professional, young professionals pursuing these, you know, types of fields. And what, what do you feel is, is there something that's missing or is it just, you know, like, is it a workload or like just losing interest? Like, have you, have you put your finger on it? Is there anything you think that is like a, a culprit, uh, you know, our main cause of this right now? Well, and that's the million dollar question. Because, and we have a lot of conversations in my industry, um, people are looking for a silver bullet. What's the silver bullet? You know, um, as a former educator, I'm like, start young, provide, I'm working with an organization called Rosie Riveters, and they do, they focus on girls and do after school and out of school programs to help them 
understand those engineering concepts and it's STEM kits and it's getting them thinking and manipulating and not afraid to fail um, because these concepts are hard. I will never forget during one of my golden apple observations, I was doing paper circuits where you take copper wire and batteries and LED lights and cardstock and you print something on one side, maybe it's a Christmas tree or it's a robot and you puncture through the cardstock with little LED lights. And if you will measure the copper tape and kind of create the design on the back and attach it to the battery, you create a full circuit and you get it to line up, but it's hard and it's painstaking. And I expected kids to make multiple mistakes, so I would have extra supplies. But they get really frustrated if they're not successful the first time. So we have to create kids that aren't scared to fail. You know, we've we've done a real good job of teaching them that failures and Fs are really bad things. But let me tell you, when I was in elementary school, I failed the sevens times tables like four times in second or third grade. I don't remember which which grade it was, but I remember the and I failed it. <laughs> but guess which times tables I know the very best to this day. And I'd say seven times table. <laughs> seven, seven, yeah. seven times one is seven. Seven times two is fourteen. Seven times three is twenty one. So it's it's important to create and we have to kind of shift our entire thinking as educators. Um and as students, but we look at Elon Musk and he has made a whole career out of failing forward, out of this iterative, des iterative design process where he builds a rocket, it blows up, he builds a better rocket next time. It might still blow up, but it's not gonna blow up for the same reasons. And then finally he gets a working rocket and he's launching one to two rockets a week out of the Space Coast right now. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question to that. The future of the space program, what is it looking like? Where is it heading, you know, with Elon Musk and, uh, you know, it seems like there are more and more people kind of getting into the space game. And how do you feel that has changed the trajectory of, you know, NASA, you know, NASA's plans, uh, you know, the, the partnerships, the collaboration? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that or like where you see this going over the next, you know, five years, 10 years? No, we, we have seen unprecedented growth. And in the last year, the space industry industry grew by 8%. In the next five years, they're projecting that it's going to grow by another 41% to be like a $500 trillion industry. So wow. we're not shrinking, which obviously means that there are more and more jobs. And yes, these private space companies, they're taking over and rightly so because they can do things cheaper and more effectively than government agencies can. So the NASA and other government agencies are starting to recognize this and say, okay, well, we need to start awarding these contracts because Blue Origin is doing a, a better job at building XYZ and they're going to build the next lunar lander. And SpaceX has got uh, launching satellites down to a science. So let's give them this contract. And there's any industry and any career that you have on Earth in these future space models where we're living and working in space and not just five or 10 people on one space station, but hundreds and someday thousands of people living and working in space. Any career we have on the ground it's going to need to be replicated they're going to have space hotels which will need space chefs they're going to need um space housekeepers they're going to need every single job that we have uh replicated in this low earth orbit economy it, it's just it's just really mind-blowing to think about where we're heading, and like you said, you know, you're talking space hotels and, and all these things, and it's still, I guess, sometimes hard to imagine. Like it's, it's remarkable, but to think like that, we're getting closer and closer to that, you know, that goal. Really, um, I, I say this. Oh no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was gonna say uh, real quick. My, my students. So you know, fifth grade students. They, you know, they know NASA and they, you know, a couple of kids on science, you know, in the science club, they went to the field trip, you know, they spent, they stayed overnight, you know, and all that stuff. But right. most kids are familiar now with those contractors. Like they, 
everyone knows Elon Musk, you know, besides from, you know, Tesla and all that stuff, like, like they know SpaceX, they know Blue Origin. And do you feel like that's going to attract the next generation of, you know, engineers and astronauts and all that? Like, because they seem very popular, like hip in, in the now right now. Absolutely. Well, not only hip in the now, but that's where the money is. And students are going to be in the workforce sooner than we realize. And if you think about it, like Axiom Space already sends private astronauts. And when I say private astronauts, I'm saying people that bought tickets to go to the International Space Station. And so this space tourism is starting to take off. Uh, there's companies like Firefly and Voyager and NanoRex and Virgin Galactic. All of these companies are growing and changing space perspective uh, do you remember Biosphere, the, the, yeah. the bio doll? Yes. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember. Yeah. So they've shifted focus, and they're now a company called Space Perspective, and they are building, in essence, I'm not going to say a hot air balloon, but a high altitude balloon that's going to raise a capsule up to near space, not past the Carmen line, but near space. Um, so, and that is a, a tourism agent where you could buy a ticket in this high altitude balloon and you can see the curvature of Earth from a very far distance. Um, <laughs> and the rate that the space industry is growing and the jobs that will be available, we just can't keep up. And any way that I can support educators to participate in some of these programs, um, there's an astronaut on the International Space Station right now at Laurel O'Hare, and she said that participating in Tomato Sphere, where you can order those tomato seeds that flew on the International Space Station, uh, was a pivotal experience in her life that changed her trajectory to want to work and live in space. And it was just growing tomato seeds that flown in space. How does an educator go about pursuing something like this? Because, you know, you're you're obviously, you know, a go-getter. And this is something that you're very passionate about uh, and you want to bring into your classroom. So I'm listening to this podcast right now and I'm an educator. And I'm thinking, what do I even start with this? Like, how do I even begin? Do uh, you have any suggestions or recommendations? Absolutely. Um, start small. Pick one thing each year because – you're already overwhelmed. You're already doing lesson plans. You're already trying to keep up with EPs and IEPs. Start small. Pick one thing. There's a lot of free programming out there, too. Um, lean heavily on resources like me. Like, I get upset when educators that know me don't reach out to me and say, hey, I'd like to do X, Y, Z with my classroom. Do you have any ideas? Because there are a lot of resources and organizations that are out there. Um, organizations like AIAA, which is the American Institute for Astronautics and Aeronautics. And they have a teacher program where they have classroom grants that are, I think, 500 to a thousand dollars. And a lot of people don't take advantage of that. Sometimes they have extra money each year. So don't try to do everything at once. Don't drink from the fire hose, but choose one thing. Choose one thing that you say, you know what? I want to do tomato sphere. And then the next year, add something else um, and make sure that it is something that relates to your, what you're already doing, because you want to use it and incorporate it seamlessly into your existing curriculum, not add something superfluous that doesn't have anything to do with what you should be teaching. But there are a lot of resources out there that really fit seamlessly within what you're already doing. Well, I can tell you right now that Tanglewood Elementary School, although I teach fifth grade at ELA, will be contacting you. Because <laughs> I will, I will, my partner, Brittany, I will tell her. <clears throat> and if Brittany, if you're listening, too bad. Sorry, you know, I, I've already decided that we're reaching out to Courtney for this for our fifth grade students. <laughs> so. And it also lets me know when I see really cool opportunities that come across my desk and they're saying, hey, we're looking for a teacher in this area or focusing on this. And the more that you interact and talk to me, I'm like, oh, NASA, you want to interview a teacher who participated in this activity? Contact Joe at Tanglewood because I know he's done this before. And it allows me to bring opportunities to you. Um, I 
my favorite part of the day is when I get emails from teachers saying, hey, I've got an idea or, hey, can you help out with this? Because, like I said, I wasn't ever going to leave the classroom unless I could help educators. And that's the best part of my job, honestly. What was what so far has been like something that was so memorable, like your favorite experience um, outside of the classroom, you know, in current position, working with International Space Station Laboratory, um, any interactions, you know, astronauts, like if you could pick one, and there's probably a couple that might come to mind, but that'd be like, wow, like this, this was cool. Like this, I can't believe I just, this happened or I just witnessed this. What, what would it be? Well, I probably, and I, I'm having to think which one um, to narrow it down because I've had several. Um, I had the privilege to meet Steve Spangler. Um, who is a science influencer. He was on the Ellen show like 27 times. He's kind of been dubbed America's science teacher. If you look up online, science teachers will know exactly who he is because he used to have a program or I still think he still runs it called Six Science. He also has a show on Prime, on Amazon Prime called DIY Sci. Super funny, super charismatic guy. And I got to actually work with him and bring him out to the space symposium in Colorado Springs to teach and do a keynote uh, speech to a group of 150 educators. And to see, and he, what we laughed, we cried. He talked about the why, why you do what you do. It was the most inspiring and impactful experience that I've had in this position because I got to see the impact it had on teachers. Um, So many educators are feeling lost and overwhelmed and overlooked. And the fact that we were able to do this for them was so very cool. So that's probably the best, but I, there's a lot of things lined up this year that I know that are probably going to top that. So I'm super excited. Well, we are definitely excited to hear you know, what the future holds for you, Courtney, and how you continue to support educators. Um, is there any parting advice that you could give? You know, you had mentioned about starting small, um, but anything else that you can leave with tonight to give educators kind of inspire some hope within, um, you know, like you said, what the educators and teachers go through, you know, yourself as an educator and the the whole you know, pay versus, you know, what's on your plate kind of thing going on. And but teachers are burnt out more now than ever. Like if, if you could give some advice or any words of wisdom, what would it be? That my time in the classroom is still some of the most rewarding, like working with Steve Spangler was phenomenal, but educating a child, um, I knew that I was making the most difference. Um, stay strong. I know it's really hard, but my biggest piece of advice would be to get your teacher tribe together. Um, Have that crew around you that builds you up, that lifts you up, that you can share ideas and resources with, um, that will, you know, cheer you on when you get that golden apple finalist um, announcement who cheers louder and um, supports you and walks with you along this journey because it's not something you should do alone. Um, a lot of teachers feel isolated, but reach out. There are a lot of different groups. Use Facebook. I mean, I met some of the most amazing educators on the Kessler Science Learning page on Facebook. I've made lifelong friends from these different organizations that I've gotten involved in, from the Teacher Liaison Program with the Space Foundation or the Space Center Houston seat crew, find that group of educators that's like you. It, it makes all the difference that uh, I didn't have my tribe. So it's like my teacher's tribe until um, I was a Golden Apple finalist and the first one, 2017. And that's when I, you know, met, uh, you know, Melissa and Jack, you, you know, yourself, and then eventually Steve Kelly, you know, pretty much every guest I've had on the show. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, it, it really did change, you know, my outlook on many things within the profession. And I, I felt renewed and re-energized and uh, met some wonderful people, you know, through programs like that uh, with the foundation and just 
like-minded individuals became more than just friend, you know, colleagues and friends and, and all those things. And it's kind of learned about each of your lives and opportunities like this through, you know, these episodes on the podcast. And, um, I really just, you know, what, what you have done. And you talk about being inspired and I'll be honest here. Uh, I remember sitting in the audience at the Golden Apple banquet when you were a Golden Apple recipient in 2019. And for those that don't know, we have a banquet uh, through the foundation, and it's a big celebration of the Golden Apple recipients and the finalists and teachers of distinction and the six recipients do give a speech. And you always, at least for myself, every year that I've attended that banquet, I always hear like one or two speeches and like, and they're all fascinating, but like, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's always like a couple that just really stand out and resonate personally, at least for myself, I felt in the past. And you, you leave and you're so inspired and just like, you can take on the world. Like, I'm ready to get back to school and I'm ready to, you know, I, I'm, I'm renewed. And I remember listening to your speech and I, I left that night and I, I told my wife at the time, I said, yeah, like that's, that's pretty amazing. And really just, it resonated and just, uh, yeah, to this day. And it's just why I said originally, I said, you know, I find you fascinating. And yeah, so just like you've been inspired by others, like, uh, and you've inspired, you know, myself and I know countless other educators across Lee County. Well, thank you. It's, it has been the honor of my life to be an educator. And I feel like I still carry that torch. And now I know that my role is different, but if I can still lift up other educators and tee them up for success and help them in a totally different way now. Um, but I remember that speech because I can remember thinking, don't cry, don't cry, <laughs> don't cry. Um, but it meant so much to be, and I know that because I can, uh, I was a finalist a couple of years before and I, and I hadn't won at that time. And I can remember kind of thinking, gosh, you know, how discouraged I was when, when I wasn't a recipient, even though I was a finalist. And I wanted to just really drive home that night that some of the best teachers in the world will probably never be recognized. Um, and, you know, some of the best teachers I've had weren't golden apple teachers, um, that what we do is really a community and we just represent, um, and we try to inspire and encourage one another, um, and lift each other up and drag them by the hand yeah. um, to be, you know, the teachers that they want to be. Yeah. Well, once again, you know, it is, we are grateful, uh, for the, all the support that you have provided the resources these past few years, uh, with supporting the teachers and students in Lee County and in your current position. Uh, for those out there, you know, uh, Courtney is, you know, as I can't tell by now, uh, a very huge advocate for the science in the STEM, which is so vital and so important to have within our schools. Um, Courtney, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight um, and just kind of hearing your story and, and just hearing your passion that you have for this Um and just once again, uh, thank you for joining me this evening. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. It has been my pleasure. Okay. Well, everyone, that's it for tonight. This is the No Frills Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Camps. And once again, joining me is the lovely Courtney Black. Courtney, have a wonderful night. We look forward to hearing what's happening in the future with your position and what's going on with NASA. I hope to have you on the show again in the future. Absolutely. I'll be in touch. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a good night.